Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, first thing I have to do is thank the guys at SharePoint Template because they, I borrowed this adapter to HDMI, and you are sp he listening to this keynote because they were so kind to, to give this, this piece. So let's give, him a, let's give him a good clap and some love. SharePoint Template, cool company, okay? <laughs> okay, so my name is Angel, Angel Medinilla. Linda Rising, the Linda Rising of Fearless Change, I met her in Portugal, and she gave me my Agile superhero name, which is Crazy Spaniard, okay? I am the Crazy Spaniard of the Agile community. You have some information here that's, uh, that might be interesting, like, for example, my, my email address, and also in this page, projectalis.com slash en in English slash Angel Medinilla, you have plenty of links to my videos. These slides that are going to be online during the weekend. Uh, you have uh, links to all the slides we use in our Kanban course, Scrum course, Leading Agile Teams course, Agile Product Management course. Everything is there. You can download it. You also have links to my LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, blog, everything Angel Medinilla. Uh, by the way, I know that Angel is very difficult to pronounce for you. No offense, I don't know how to pronounce this. Last week I was in Aachen and I was like, no, I'm giving a keynote at Bodensee. And they were like, where? <laughs> Bodensee? Where? Bodensee? Oh, Bodensee. What? Boden, 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 Boden. I'm sorry, I cannot. I, I tried. <laughs> okay? So if you cannot say Angel properly, that's a matter. It's a, I, I can take it. Who am I? Well, I'm, a, uh, I'm an Agile speaker. I'm very regular at the European Conference Tour. And, and I also, this year, I went to the United States for a Scrum gathering in uh, Las Vegas. Um, this is what gives me the kicks, okay? This is like the best thing I, I can do. I, it's so fun. I love talking to people and making people laugh. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm also a, a regular coach, trainer, working with real customers and real companies and real teams on the trenches of real life. You know, it's easy to go get here on stage and say, you have to collaborate with your customers. And you are like, you have to meet my customer, okay? <laughs> then you tell me to collaborate with him. He's a psychopath, okay? So it's very nice to have things in the books and have ideas in the shower in the morning. Oh, I had this agile new idea. But then you have to go to the trenches and work with real teams in the real stuff. And I can assure you that I know a couple of things uh, about that. Uh, some of that experience I put in one book I wrote, uh, Agile Management. Sorry, Vasco, it was published by Springer and not by Happy Mail Express. We have a good quarrel about that. And... Um, I'm also part of the Management 3.0 community. How many of you know about this thing called Management 3.0? Can you raise your hands? Oh, nice. In some places over Europe, it's not that popular. We're still working on that. And now we are moving the platform to something new that is called Happy Melly. Because now we don't want to be about management anymore. Management is important. But the most important thing we found is that uh, only 14% or 20% of the people are fully engaged and enjoying their work. And this is awful, okay? We have to change that. We have a, a massive amount of people that are not happy at work. Okay, my pleasure. Where those were my vanity slides, so you could uh, frame me and say, oh, who's this guy and where is he coming from? So 40 minutes, holy cow, I have 90 slides. <laughs> What do you mean 40 minutes? Show some love to your keynote speakers. Give me four hours or something like that so I can properly explain things. Oh, gosh, let's see what I can do. I probably will fail miserably in trying to get 90 slides in 40 minutes, but let's see what happens. It's going to be fun. So you want to be agile. Okay, nice. Be agile, my friend. Okay, this is fantastic. Everybody wants to be agile. I have a lot of companies that approach me and say, hey, Angel, Oh, now I say Angel. <laughs> I think I can't pronounce my own name now. <laughs> hey, Angel, we need you to help us be agile. And my question is always the same. Why? Why do you want to be agile? And my customers go like, uh, what do you mean why? <laughs> you know, we want to be agile in order to be agile. And I just, yes. I know that the name is cool. Who doesn't want to be agile? The, the, the other thing, not being agile, is like being clumsy or like being, I don't know, who wants to be clumsy? We all want to be agile. But I'm like, no, no, why do you want to be agile? What's the reason? And then my customers go like, uh, let me think, What's, what was it? Oh, yeah, I know, everyone else is doing it. <laughs> but that's not a good reason. Six months ago, everybody was dancing the Gangnam style like crazy. Everyone else was doing it. This guy is Eric Schmidt. He's the CEO of a company you might have heard of. It's called Google, okay? And he was doing the Gangnam style. So many people say, hey, if we do the Gangnam style, we are going to be like Google. 
Let's put a Guitar Hero room. Yeah, great idea. If we have a Guitar Hero room and we let developers play Guitar Hero, we're going to be like Google. Huh? This is called the golf fallacy, OK? You study like the 500 most successful companies in the world. You study the CEOs of those companies, and you find that all of them play golf. So you are like, hey, let's make our chief executive officer play golf, and then we'll be successful. Correlation doesn't mean cause, OK? We pastafaris know at all about that. <laughs> um, it's also no about us, let's jump onto it, okay? There's a train passing by, let's jump onto it. Everyone is doing agile, let's jump onto it. Where's the train going? I don't know, but everyone else is doing it. Calm down, my friends. <laughs> Calm down. Why do you want to be agile? Think again. So we have been there. We have done that. It's the same management fads that we have been having all these years, like CMMI, this is the thing to do right now, or um, project management body of knowledge, or software engineering, we have been talking about that, the ideas of Tom DeMarco in the 80s. Later on, he said, you know what? I was damn wrong. <laughs> okay, was, I'm sorry, guys, I was wrong. <laughs> Yay, Tom DeMarco. <laughs> and how do we know that Agile is not the new fad? How do we know it's not part of the evil empire of software methodologies that we have been swallowing during the, the last 50 plus years? Mm, that's a tough question. So I ask you again, why do you want to be agile? And some of my clients, they say, oh, it's because we want to be hyper productive. We are going to be hyper productive if we do a scrum. And I'm like, yeah, how are you going to be hyper productive? And again, my customers go like, uh, what do you mean how? <laughs> Hyperproductive life in hyperproductive teams, you know. And I'm like, yeah, but how are those teams going to be hyperproductive? The usual answer is, well, Jeff Sutherland says so. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, okay, Jeff is great. I do admire Jeff Sutherland, but what if he's wrong? I don't know. How, how says Jeff Sutherland that those teams become hyperproductive? And my customers are like, oh, well, let me think. Or oh, maybe it's something about post-it notes. If we put post-it notes everywhere, we are making the corn grow like taller and have better crops. And I'm like, yeah, that's because of the reality distortion field of the post-it notes, no? Or what's that? Oh, no, no, but there's more than post-it notes. We also have burned down diagrams. Burned down diagrams are going to turn us hyperproductive. And I'm like, I don't see how. Oh, yeah, yeah, but there's also this thing called planning poker. And there's also this thing that is called user stories. As a plant, I want to be a plant so I can be a plant. And when we do that, then we are going to be hyperproductive. That's cargo cult agile. That's mimicking what, what hyperproductive, hyperproductive teams are doing. And you have the, the faith that if you do the same things, then you will be hyperproductive too. This is like creating a, a, a Guitar Hero room in your company, believing that if you let developers play Guitar Hero, then we will be like a startup again, and we will be like Google. So bad reason, think again. Some people are like, no, we want to empower people. Oh, yeah, that's like communist revolution. We tried that. It didn't work. Okay, so keep thinking. I don't believe in this thing about empowering people and let them take the decisions. Come on, guys. We tried that hard, and it didn't work. Oh, but Agile practice our tool and tools are cool and fun. We are doing stand-up meetings. How cool is that? And we have tokens that we pass around, and you get to talk when you have the token. And then we do retrospectives, and we play pass the ball, and we draw trees. And I, and I like, what's, key? what's this, kindergarten? <laughs> How is this going to turn us hyperproductive? Oh, well, uh, I don't know. Then why do you want to be agile? Oh, because there's these certificates. <laughs> we have these certificates that are so nice, so cool. And they are so cheap, you go to, two day, to a two-day course and you get this neat, beautiful certificate. You know what? It ha the, the case came that some cats already get, had the Scrum Master certificate. Because basically, you go online, you do some tests, you do some random answers, and you can get the uh, certificate. In Scrum.org, it's like half an hour of your time, $100, you are certified. I think that J.B. Rinsberger, Rinsberger, great guy, he did an online uh, application that you just push a button and you get a certificate, okay? So, so, you know, what's the value of those certificates that even a cat can get? 
By the way, if you include lolcats in your presentation, that improves your, the keynote appreciation and evaluation by 75%, okay? <laughs> lolcats are great. <laughs> it's a good trick you learn in the trade, okay? Uh, <laughs> you want certificates, I will give you certificates. You buy them from me. I will make them half the price, and instead of being Scrum Masters, you will be Scrum Masters of the universe. How cool is that? Huh? <laughs> I will even give you a model of the Gray School Castle. Okay? <laughs> or we can start a decertification program. I will decertify you, and then you will be able to de decertify others for a fee. Okay? <laughs> Good business for everyone. So that's what you want to be agile about? We have a, 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 an upcoming portfolio of certificates. We, gonna, we are going to be uh, selling the Certified Scrum Mom certificate. How cool is that? You're going to be the mother for the team. What's happening here? We have this problem. Let me take care of it. You get back to your homework. Right? You, you get the team to get together, and you protect the team, and you let them raise. And we are going to do the Certified Post-it Virtuoso. Hmm? I'm a professional of moving Post-its on the wall. And we are going to be to, where's Vasco? Is Vasco around? Vasco, where are you? Vasco Duarte is not here. What happens? <laughs> I assure him, I left him into it yesterday in good state. He will be coming around. We are, going to, we are discussing with Vasco the idea of doing a certified, no estimates messiah, <laughs> which is much better than a master, okay? <laughs> you are going to be, nobody gets to argue with you if you are a messiah. We are doing no estimates. Why? Because I say so. I am the messiah. And nobody gets to argue back. How cool is that? We are going to make that certificate available soon. Anyway, so keep trying. Why do you want to be agile? And some people are like, oh, there's a lot of reasons we want to be agile. For example, we are buried in paperwork. We have like paperwork and bureaucracy everywhere. And we have meetings, long meetings, meetings everywhere. We have to meet like for taking even the, the, the most Small decision, we have to make meetings. And also we are suffering lack of creativity. Everyone is like so dull and doing the same thing over and over and over. And of course we have motivation problems. And that's what Happy Melly is about, about creating happy companies. And maybe Agile will help us be more motivated. And of course, we have lots of stress. The silent killer, one of the worst plagues of 20th century and it's still around and alive. Also, we are suffering from clueless management, okay? We have managers that doesn't distinguish their head from their feet, and they seem to have just two buttons to manage the company. One button is, I need more resources, and the other button is, just do it, <laughs> okay? It's like, the deadline is 30, uh, the 31st of December. No, it's not possible. Then I need my, my, more resources. There are not more resources available. Then just do it, <laughs> And it's like, with those two buttons, you can manage General Motors, you can manage a bank, you can manage whatever, two buttons. I need more resources. No, then just do it. <laughs> really? You went to a, a master class and you took 30 years of study, 20 years of practice, and you ended up with two buttons in your desk? Oh, well, oh my God. Anyway, more problems we have in the companies. We have knowledge silos. We want to get rid of that. People are like working on their own and they don't exchange ideas anymore. And we also have like endless hierarchies. We have like the, the hierarchy coming from the top executive to the board and the chief executive officer and the medium management and it's like endless. And also we have scaling problems. Once we get uh, to a given size, we don't know how to scale. And also we have lack of visibility. We cannot see what we are doing. We just see two weeks on, on the future. Uh, six months, one year is like derby dragons. We don't know what's happening. And also, of course, we have like, like unhappy customers. Many times these customers are really, really unhappy because we are doing the wrong products. You know, this product here, this product here maybe was done by the most agile team in the world. You don't know. Maybe they were doing like stand-up meetings and post-it notes and planning poker, and they were doing Scrum and Kanban and XP and feature-driven development, and still they delivered a product that nobody wants and nobody cares about. And that's not Agile's fault. And being Agile is not going to solve your problem of developing the wrong products. Some people are doing very wrong products, like the magnificent watermelon transporter, okay? This is a real product that you can buy. Or they are very, very wrong products. <laughs> like, for example, this magnificent tray that you can put in your steering wheel in order to have your Big Mac, the American thing, of course, okay? This is an American product. Or they are very, very, very wrong products, like our dear friend Clippy, the office assistant, died 2004. It seems that you're like you're writing a document. Do you need some help? Fuck off. <laughs> 
So yeah, we're going to be agile. Maybe the Clippy team was the most agile team ever. You don't know. And agile didn't solve that. Okay? So wrong reasons. These are not problems that you are going to solve. These are symptoms of something more profound. You are looking at the symptoms and you wish or you think or you have some faith that Agile will solve everything and will solve all that. But you don't have a clue on how it's going to happen. So, uh, wrong reasons. We have to keep thinking. In order to make it worse, I'm going to make, give you some facts about what does it mean to turn Agile and to be Agile. Fact number one, Agile is hard. It's damn hard. Agile transformation, fastest thing that I've ever seen is like six, eight months to start seeming an Agile company, and, and that's with the full support of all managerial levels, the, the owners of the company, all the teams, everyone on board. You need like six, eight months of real chaos of transforming your, your, your business. Most of the time, the most successful transformations that I've known have meant that 20% of the people left the company. Ken Schwaber agrees on that. If you have read um, uh, Enterprise Agile, or Agile Enterprise, I don't remember the title, he says that in any Agile transformation, real Agile transformation project, you should be willing to let go 20% of your people. And if you understand the, the Geoffrey Moores and the other guy, I never remember his name, the crossing the chasm diagram, 20% of the people, they are laggards. They will just resist any kind of change. And it's not possible to work with those people. There is, there's no, no sense on arguing with those people. So probably, it will mean that you will have to let go a lot of people that are not ready to work in an agile way. And they are not willing to do that. Another fact is that agile is going to piss off a lot of people. Do you know about this thing, the Programming Mother F Manifesto? How many of you know about that? Raise your hands. Some of you, okay? This is the Programming Mother F Manifesto, okay? And it says something like, we are a community of Mother F programmers who have been humiliated by software development methodologies for years. We are tired of XP, Scrum, Kanban, Waterfall, Software Craftsmanship, also known as XP Lite, and anything else getting in the way of programming Mother F. <laughs> okay, people are really, really tired because they don't see the point. We are telling them, go to meetings, do stand-ups, use post-it notes, play poker, and they are like, why? Oh, because it's going to turn us hyper-productive. Why? I don't know. Keep doing it, and let's see what happens. We don't know the reasons. We don't understand. So people are really getting pissed off. Um, more facts. Agile, it's scary. It'll, it will scare the be Jesus out of many people because the language, the terminology is so damn wrong. We should have better marketing. Like, for example, for example, certified scrum master, that's great marketing. But when you start talking about no estimates, a lot of people get scared. But I need estimates. So if we do Agile and I have no estimates, how can I meet deadlines? No, 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 you don't care about deadlines anymore. What? <laughs> And they start talking about self-organizing teams and panarchies. Tobias Meyer is talking about panarchy and sociocracy in the company, like everyone is participating in the decisions. And you, you talk to managers and you are like, you have to let your developers decide the future of the companies. And they are like, what? Yeah, you have to let your developers decide the future of the companies. And the manager says, my developers? Yeah, you have to let your developers decide the future of the company. And the managers go like, have you seen my developers? <laughs> it's scary, okay? There's a lot of terms like, like there's no career path. You are all team members. No more, no more analysts, no more DBAs, no more testers. And they're like, yeah, but what about my career path? No, there's not such a thing as a career path in Agile. So this is really scary, and they are like, no, 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 I don't want to do that. Of course, there's a lot of misinformation in these terms. The, here comes a big one. Agile will lower your productivity, at least at the beginning. On any transformation, there's a J curve. At the beginning, you have to invest, and you have to change the way you're doing things. Like, for example, you've been programming all your life in COBOL. In fact, you don't have eyebrows anymore because of the green terminals. Okay, You know a COBOL programmer because they don't have eyebrows. Okay? <laughs> and, and you have been doing COBOL for your whole life, and then you have to switch to Java. So on Monday, we start doing Java. So in Monday, you know, Java is like more flexible. You have frameworks. It's more productive. So you turn off COBOL on Friday. You start with Java on Monday, and everything is like better, no? 
No, it's like hell. You don't understand anything. You don't know how to do things. You don't know how to program. You don't know how to create new things. Every single time you introduce some change in the system, the system will lower the productivity. And then we will start ramping up until we raise a point. We, need, we, we, uh, we meet a point where we have the same productivity that we had in the last system, in the, in the previous system. And that's fantastic because that's payback, uh, break even, I mean. Okay? And if you go on improving, then you will have a better uh, productivity and you will start paying off the debt of introducing a new system, a new framework, a new tool, a new idea. But there's not such a thing as instant improvement. That's a, an infinite velocity of improvement and the universe doesn't like infinites. Okay? Bad things happen when you count on infinites. Uh, so at the beginning, when you start an agile transformation for some time, it's going to be like lower productivity. For example, when you establish with limits and you are like, no, no, we don't work in more things, we just work in less things. And on the, on the long term, that's going to make you more productive. But on the first moment, what you feel is like you have low, lower productivity. It's like, for example, when you take your best per person out of a team and out of a project, and you turn him into a free electron, someone that is able to move around the whole company looking at teams and making them better. And being, able to, uh, and being available in order to solve great big problems and big troubles that different teams are having. But the first thing you notice is that you have your best employee out of the production line. So the production line goes in a lower productivity way. On the long term, that person is going to be improving the production line. But at the beginning, you are going to lower the productivity. And of course, the owners are like, not now. Right now, it's not possible. And you're like, when? Oh, when we are like, mm, less busy. And, like, <laughs> and I like, <laughs> I have been working for 25 years and I can't recall that time. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's, it's going to lower your productivity at the beginning. It will challenge the corporate culture. It will challenge the status quo. Some people will challenge the way that top management, owners of the company, uh, middle management are doing things and they are going to say, that's not right. That's not the actual way of doing things. And that's going to be a conflict. And we are so afraid of conflict. Um, it's also going to ask for things that right now seems impossible. It's like when in Toyota, uh, they had this problem in the production line. We were talking about that this morning in the breakfast. They had this problem that every single time they wanted to change from the production of one car to another, they have to change the molds, the dies, okay? And the molds were things that were pressing metal down and creating the frames for the cars. And in order to change that mold, they needed one day and a half because it was like something that wasted tons and you have to take that out, put another mold, and then you had to adjust it millimetrically, manually, and it took like one day and a half. And it was so much time. Toyota wanted to create small batches of products, like 100 cars, instead of 10,000, Detroit style. And they couldn't because of this problem, and it seemed impossible. And then uh, I believe it was uh, Sakichi Toyoda, Shihio Shingo, and, uh, and Taichi Ono, they said, you have to be able to do that in a one minute, in single minute. And at the beginning, they dropped that to 10 hours. And it was amazing, but they say, no, no, it's not enough. You have to bring it down to one minute. And it seemed impossible. But still, they managed to bring it down to nine minutes. And they changed the face of the world, basically. There's this story about Steve Jobs talking to the guy that was responsible of the boot process of the Macintosh. And he said, hey, the booting process of the Macintosh is taking two minutes and a half. That's too much. You have to make it like in 30 seconds. And the engineer said, that's not possible. And Steve Jobs told him, what if there were human lives in, 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 play, in, 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 in uh, how do you say that, in, in stake? And he was like, no, no, don't be extreme, Steve. There are not human lives in stake. And they were like, yes, they are. Because there are some people that are booting the machine three times, four times a day. And that means that they are losing two minutes every time. That's eight minutes every day. And you have like two million people doing that. Okay, so that's like eight million minutes every, every day. Okay, and that's in a whole year, it's several lifetimes. And he was like, oh, I never saw it that way. So he was able to bring down the booting process to 10 seconds or 15 seconds or something like that. So Agile will ask for things that right now seem impossible. Also, uh, your people is going to be asked to, to retrospect and to, to, plan, uh, to, to do team planning and team games. And they have to play power uh, planning poker and they have to write tests and automate tests. And they will be asked to do continuous integration. And there are a whole lot of things they, they have to start doing instead of just working. They are like, why are we spending time doing retrospective instead of being in our places working? 
This is additional work. And you have to tell them, no, this is not additional work. This is the work. You have to tell your people that they are not paid to program. They are paid to make the company successful in any single way they can think of. And that's a huge change. Even worse, they are going to be asked to, to do coaching and leading and listening and motivating and talking and sharing and trusting and collaborating and hugging trees and singing the kumbaya. And, and you know, if, if you know some software developers, which I happen to know some of them, they will go into computer style. I'm sorry, Dave, I cannot do that. <laughs> because they are used to be very like left side of the brain, very analytic, very systematic. And when you start talking to them about human things, uh, you know, they are, they are not used to that. We have gone through school, high school, college, and we never been asked to do things like collaborate just for some small project on, on, the, on the last year where you do all the work and some pretty ladies uh, join your team and get the same mark. At least that was my experience. <laughs> you know, I did all the project and they were like just hanging around and they had the, the, the same mark and I did it all. So we don't know how to do this collaboration thing. Oh, and get ready for a big one, please. Hold your breath. Many successful companies, they are not agile. And you go like, what? <laughs> These are some girls, girls' reaction to a kiss in a wedding. <laughs> okay, this is a... <laughs> so you get in the same mode. Many, I'm going to repeat that. Many successful companies that, I, that are earning big bucks, they are not agile, and they are doing fine. So what? In fact, where are the agile, hyper-productive companies that are beating the heck out of the market? Where are they? Sometimes, you know, sometimes I feel like Buzz Aldrin, you know, this guy was to the moon, and Buzz Aldrin was recently in, a, in an interview, he said, they promised me Mars colonies in the year 2000. Instead, I got Facebook. <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> and Angry Birds, <laughs> okay? <laughs> you know, in, in, the year, in the 70s, we were able to go to the moon with a computer that had 64K memory. Right now, we have thousands of times that capacity in our pockets, and what we do, instead of throwing things to the moon, we throw some birds to some pigs. Okay? That's what we do with the huge processing capacity that we have in our pockets. This is so depressing and so disappointing. And I feel the same when, when I say, hey, when we started with Agile, they promised me hyper-productive companies. Where are those hyper-productive companies? Show me them. I'm sorry. Show me the money. <laughs> okay, do you remember uh, this movie? And Tom Cruise, show me the money. <laughs> And we never talk about the money when we talk about Agile. We talk with the teams and we're talking about planning poker and stand-up meetings and TDD and BDD and XDD and a lot of things that end in DD. But, but how often do we talk about the money? I think that's the reason that many people are already leaving the Agile ship. Now, the post thing is to pose yourself as a post-Agilist. How cool is that, okay? No, no, I'm not into that Agile thing anymore. Agile is something about selling certificates and management, uh, management consultants and consultancy gigs and training business. I'm a post-Agilist. I'm past that, okay? So we already have people leaving the Agile ship and you want to be Agile now. Who cares? Come on, wrong. Let's go to something else that is not Agile. Agile is already sinking ship. So let me ask you again, why do you want to be Agile? Right now everyone is like, wow, you're breaking my Agile toy. I was so happy coming to this Agile conference. And now you tell me that Agile is not worth it. Okay, right now this is like the worst Agile keynote ever, I know. <laughs> so please remember the lolcats, eh? Lolcats are fine. <laughs> please remember the lolcats when you do an evaluation of the, <laughs> of the, of the, of the keynote. Okay, in order to have some better evaluations, but just for that, uh, let's give you one good reason to be, to, do you want the previous <laughs> slide? <laughs> <Two seconds. laughs> this is going to be awesome, I want that picture. <laughs> so let me give you one reason, one good reason that you want to be agile. Survival. Survival is a good reason, not planning poker, not post-it notes, not fun, not stand-up meetings, not BDD, TDD. Screw BDD, screw Scrum. Scrum is not important, screw Kanban. Kanban is not important. The important thing is survival. Even if you don't make money, the important, the best goal, the main goal of the company is survive. 
In order to do that, eventually you will have to make some money. But making money is not the only goal. You can make a lot of money in a quarter and then go bankrupt in the next quarter. So the ultimate goal of a company is survival. If you want to convince your managers that this agile thing is worth it, you have to talk to them in their language. And you have to talk to them not about post-it notes and planning programs, stand-up meetings and BDD and TDD and continuous integration. They are like, yeah, new toys. No, you have to talk to them about survival of the company. Survival is a matter of adaptation. This is a cool picture I took this year uh, in New York in the Natural History Museum. Okay? And they have this, this scene where you see a predator here and there's some, some form of animal fleeing and it's called the Great Race. And it says this chase took place in North America 14.5 million years ago. Amphision, a meat-eating relative of bears, pushes a small antelope-like plant eater, Ramoceros. And it says, who won? We can't know. But we do know that over generations, competition between, between predators and prey can make both of them faster and more agile. And I was seeing that and I was like, ooh, I have to use that in a keynote. <laughs> so, so here it is, bring to you. <laughs> So yeah, we're talking about survival, and survival is a matter of adaptation. Why do, you, do we need to adapt? Well, first of all, there are new species arriving. We have very bad, mean guys that are arriving to the market and are, mm, are, are, are a menace. Uh, uh, they are threatening our position in the markets and our way of living. Yesterday, Vasco said something really interesting that was that companies, big companies right now, are designed to work in order to maintain the lifestyle of those managing the companies. That's a wrong goal. And of course, the people that, you know, prosper in that kind of environment are the ones that still maintain the cycle going. But if you just center yourself around your belly button about our lifestyle, our company, our product, you are maybe not seeing the guys coming from China and from other places that are really, really threatening our existence and our survival. Also, there's changes in environment. Environment is changing, technology is changing, market is changing, consumers are changing. And if you don't adapt to that, then you're going to fail. You're not going to survive. Uh, Deming said, survival is, uh, you know, mm, you don't need to change. Change is optional. And also survival is optional. If you don't want to change, that's okay. You don't have to survive. But if you want to survive, you have to change and you have to adapt. Okay? More reasons you have to adapt. Faster product cycles. You know, when you were... Uh, General Electric invented something that they called yearly budget. Have you heard about that? The yearly budget? <laughs> it takes like 30% of the management time over the year, managing the budget and creating the budget. And of course, it's, it's all a whole, uh, a full lie, okay? It's, we can talk about the beyond budgeting movement and things like that. But when General Electric created the, the yearly budget as a management tool, they had product cycles and market cycles of maybe five years. So they were doing cycles, five or four or five steering cycles over any product cycle, market cycle. They didn't worry about something happening in the next three months or in the next six months. But right now, if you just turn around for a, for a year or two years, then something called Facebook appears and gets 50 million clients. Or maybe something called WhatsApp appears and in a year gets 200 million clients. So you cannot just stay doing the same thing because the market is changing so fast. Also, globalization. 20 years ago, if you were doing software in Spain, you were basically competing with the big, big guys, which were like three or four guys uh, working for banks and, and huge companies. But you could make some software for small, medium companies, and your competitor was some guy on the other side of the street. Right now, you are competing with people all around the globe. You, you know, it's, it, we have commoditized software. You can buy software anywhere, it's not a problem. You know, this is 2004, and these were the most big companies in the internet in 2004. Six years later, all the red guys are out of the game, and you have new guys, new kids on the block. And for example, in 2004, you can see that you had uh, no one Chinese company here, and when you see 2010, you have Chinese company, uh, Chinese company, Chinese company. So they are like competing with us and, and getting more and more market. So again, this is a matter of survival. Many of you think like, oh no, but we are big enough and we are market leaders. Yeah, all these guys thought the same. Okay, Kodak was market leader and is diseased. Panam. 
Transworld Airlines, three witches airborne. <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> three witches airborne in the, when one of the Terry Pratchett's novels. Two, uh, TWA, they don't exist anymore. There's no Pan Am, there's no TWA. They were deceased. Hammer, deceased. Lehman Brothers, and Lehman Brothers was like too big to fail, okay? When the, when the um, uh, subprime mortgage bubble, they said, okay, we are too big to fail. The government won't let us fail, fact number one, because if we fail, we are going to produce some worldwide chaos. And they were partially right. <laughs> okay, so, so there were bigger guys than you that have already ceased to exist because they didn't adapt to a change in environment, to a change in technology, to a change in competitors. Most of the people that I see, they are looking for conformance to the Agile process. They are using checklists. Are we doing planning poker? Yeah, glad. 10 points. Are we doing continuous integration? Yeah, 10 points. Are we doing stand-up meetings? Yeah, 10 points. Wow, we are really, really Agile. We have 90 points out of 100. We are going the right direction. We have conformance to the process. That's so 20th century. Here's the process, you have to conform to that. Um, and conformance to the process can lead to a whole bunch of problems. I always say that it's so easy to fake Scrum. Okay, for example, every, you, you keep doing things exactly like you're doing them in the last 10 years, uh, but now every single time you are asked to do something, you write it on a post-it note and you put it on a column that says pending. And then when you start working on that, you put it on another column that says ongoing. And when it's done, you move it to a column that is called done. And then, hey, you are doing Scrum. And they are like, no, 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 but they are the process and the ceremonies. Oh, yeah, once a month, our boss shows up and says, hey, guys, this has to be done in a month. <laughs> we call that product planning. <laughs> okay. And then once every month, after the, the, the release, when all hell breaks loose, <laughs> we go to a pub, we order some beers, and we are like, dude, this place stinks. And we call that retrospective. Okay, so... So now you're doing the whole Scrum process, 99 points percent, and still you are not agile. You have conformance to the process, but still you are suffering of no coordination, wrong products, cargo call, low productivity, long lead times, lack of business alignment, no clear results, bad self-organization everywhere. So if you are polysymptomatic, if you have all these things like low morale, bad motivation, stress, lack of visibility, all the things we are discussing, you are probably doing it wrong. Like this guy here trying to, to get that fire off, okay? You are doing it wrong. <laughs> hey, Bob, what? <laughs> Maintain that host, okay? <laughs> Final message. True Agile is not about conformance to the process. It's about delivery. Delivery is, for me, the heart of Agile. If you are doing, I had, I was with this company that they were saying, no, we are, we are very Agile. We do a release every two weeks. And I was like, whoa, that's impressing. But tell me something, what are you releasing this, to, this, in this cycle? And they said, oh, it was something we started one year ago. <laughs> so yeah, we are releasing things every two weeks, but we started them two years ago. So they, uh, when I say delivery, it's not only delivery every two years. I, I frequent delivery is not only the point. You can be frequently delivering something that nobody wants, okay? So it's delivering the right thing and delivering it fast in, in, in proper product cycles and market cycles. True Agile is also about learning. If you are not learning, you are doing it wrong. I see people doing the same retrospective over and over and over and over. I call that Groundhog Day retrospective. <laughs> Do you remember that movie where he was doing the same day over and over and over? Okay, that's Groundhog Day. And I see the same. If you are not learning, if you are not, if you are not adapting, if you are not changing things, if you are not improving, if your company is not changing, then what the hell are you doing that you call that Agile? Please don't call it Agile, call it something else. Call it conformance to the Agile process. The problem is that many people are doing Agile. They are doing retrospectives. They are doing stand-up meetings. They are doing continuous integration. They are doing with limits. They are doing Kanban. And you have to stop doing Agile. My message here, if you have to understand why Agile is important to you, link Agile to the survival of the company and understand how Agile is helping you survive in a threatening environment. 
Konosuke Matsushita said, in this changing environment, the only way we can survive is gathering the last bit of talent and intelligence of every single working, uh, worker on the company. That's the only way we can survive. And we have to recover that idea that Konosuke Matsushita was discussing in the 80s. Come on, guys. You have to stop doing agile. You have to embrace being agile, living by the values of agile, creating agile cultures, living the culture, changing the company, empowering the teams, having courage, questioning your managers and questioning the things that we are doing that go against the survival of the company. And we are just doing that in order to preserve the lifestyle of the people managing the company. We have to create a company of uh, a culture of improvement. We have to create a culture of quality. We have to create a true culture, culture of customer collaboration and customer focus. You know, all telecommunication industries, they are like, we are customer center. We, are, we love our customers. We are about delighting customers. Yeah, I tried your customer service. So stop bullshitting me. <laughs> so What's the meaning of being agile? Uncover better ways of delivering great products. It's not about developing software. Developing software is good for 2001 Agile Manifesto. Right now we have to think beyond that. It's not only about the software. Software is waste. Lines of code is waste. You don't want double the lines of code, triple the lines of code. You want as few lines of code as possible. So it's not about developing software. When they say developing software, they were talking about delivering great products, the right products the right way. So Agile is about delivering great products, finding better ways of delivering those products, then do it and help others do it. Or in other words, get funky and then let others find the funk. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was my keynote. Yay, 41 minutes.